well, welcome everybody um, to this uh, uh, working session. Uh, people kept telling me, uh, good luck with your talk. This is not a talk. This is going to be a working session. You are, you are going to be doing um, the talking. Um, of course, we will set the stage a little bit. Uh, and um, uh, Actually, I'm a bit surprised that uh, this is, appears to be the only session about ethics in this conference, because it is, especially in, uh, well, certainly in Europe, where I have, of course, more of an overview of what's going on, it's, it's really uh, getting to be a hot topic in the architecture uh, world. So, uh, but we have, I guess, the privilege of uh, uh, trying to, uh, to establish something here. And uh, Michael and I are not ethicists or anything. We're not philosophers. Uh, we're just trying to find our way into this, some of this uh, kind of difficult material, and we need your help for that. So uh, it, it, the, if you look at the presentation, the conclusion slide at this point is still empty, right? It's up to you guys to fill the conclusion slide together with us. OK. Um, well, what are we talking about? Um, OK, who are we? Um, do we need any introduction? Yeah, they're here for the ethics. Yeah, OK, so, yeah, so, I mean, we have pictures with beards, and we are both here without beards, but still balding. <laughs> so. <laughs> OK. So we will uh, uh, first talk about why ethics, why we think ethics is, a, is an interesting topic and, and an important topic. And we'll give you some, some examples of uh, uh, how things can go terribly wrong and if you don't care about ethics. And then we will give some ideas about what could be ethical practices for architects. And, but but we, are, we have a very poor story there because we only have two sort of uh, uh, lightweight ideas and we don't have any real uh, real practices yet and then we will uh, start you off with group discussions you will have uh, um, uh, you will you will get five scenarios from us uh, up uh, and uh, we'll introduce those those to you and then it's up to you to discuss those scenarios and uh, we will close with uh, some with, with some plenary, plenary plenary discussion about this okay so this guy is uh, James Liang. And James Liang, uh, if you look at his job description, he, he's described in the media as an engineer working for Volkswagen. But if you look at his job dis description, he is actually a high-level software architect. And James Liang was involved in uh, one of the worst architectural decisions ever made at Volkswagen. This was about creating a piece of software that um, that sort of uh, this, the cheats, cheats, cheats the, uh, the government into thinking that uh, cars are cleaner than they actually are. And I'm sure I don't need to go into very much details, but I actually I read a book about this. By the way, he got 40 months, 40 months in prison. And that was a plea deal. I mean, if, he had, if it would have gone to court, he probably would have uh, uh, had a longer sentence. So this is a fascinating book about uh, how this whole Volkswagen scandal came into, uh, into being. It talks a lot about the, the, the main players. And, uh, uh, but if you look at this, uh, how it came into being, it's a fascinating story. Uh, this is called the acoustic function uh, that they are talking about. Why is it called the acoustic function? Well, Volkswagen didn't. Uh, uh, develop by themselves the function that detects whether a car is in a lab or not, right? How can you tell whether a car is in a lab? Well, if you see that the wheels are running at a certain speed and the steering wheel is not turning, then that's, that's one indicator. And there are several other indicators like outside temperature, etc. And uh, so they have this function that's trying to guess whether the car is actually out on the road being used by actual users or just in a, in a labor laboratory being tested for, by the government. And why is this called the acoustic function? Well, because it was stumbled upon by uh, Volkswagen uh, uh, software architects uh, when they were examining uh, the uh, software that was originally developed by Audi, which is a different brand, but they were reusing that software and they, were look, they saw this strange function, and they were thinking, why is this the acoustic function? Well, because originally, the only reason that they had this function was that uh, they noticed that if the, uh, uh, the pollution settings were set at its strictest, 
uh, that one of the engines of Audi uh, made too much noise. It was quite noisy. And um, so they wanted to have a more silent car, and that's why they called this the acoustic function. And that got sort of reused, and uh, 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 it was, in the end, it was a very strange, strange trade-off. It's not as if the uh, Volkswagen engineers were not able to achieve the required pollution levels. They were perfectly able to do that. However, um, it required... A, uh, to, to get the right level of uh, NOx uh, exhaust uh, required a uh, urea uh, solution, something that had to be added to the, to the engine, and it, was, uh, it would, had to be put in a little tank. And, I, and those of you who have a, a, a diesel car like that, is there anyone who has a, a Volkswagen diesel or an Audi diesel? Nobody dares raise their hands. <laughs> That's not very popular in the US. Well, anyway, if you have one of those, then um, uh, when you take the car in, to the, in for maintenance to the garage, they actually need to refill that, uh, uh, that, uh, that little tank. And the only thing that uh, they were worried about was that if uh, they were actually uh, compliant with, uh, while driving around normally, compliant with the exhaust levels that were required by the government, that this tank would be empty too soon, which meant that you had to take the car to the shop not once every 1,000 miles, but, uh, sorry, 10,000 miles, but once every 5,000 miles. And they were worried that that would hurt their sales. That was the only reason that they put this in. It wasn't really necessary from a technical point of view. It was just a sales uh, thing, yeah. And the question, of course, that uh, remains, uh, it still has not been you know, finally resolved, is whether Herr Matthias Müller, the CEO or his predecessor who actually uh, you know, had to leave a few days after this whole thing blew up, uh, knew what was going on. Um, but the, the attitude towards this whole problem is incredible. It's like, you know, they consider it to be, it to be a technical problem. Um, and uh, we had some targets for our technical engineers and they solved it with some software solutions. Now we do not know whether this is actually true, whether the software engineers uh, actually uh, decided by themselves to, to, to build in this cheating device or to utilize it, uh, or whether they were told to do so. Uh, but if you look at the rest of the book, it looks like a combination of fear and unrealistic expectations that really led to this, this, this uh, situation. Um, so, that's one example. Yeah. I'll give you another one. Machine bias. So, uh, uh, does anyone of you know about the Compass algorithm? No? This hasn't hit the media here in the United States. It's interesting because it's a, it's a local problem. It's a local United States uh, thing. Um, the Compass algorithm is an algorithm that uses 138 parameters to predict uh, the risk of uh, how do you pronounce that word? Recidivism? Recidivism? Okay. Um, and it is actually, uh, it's a risk assessment for persons who are in jail. And uh, when the person is up for parole, then some judge has to decide whether or not they can actually go for parole and, or are a too great a risk to society. How is this risk assessed? Well, it's, it's assessed by these 138 uh, parameters. Uh, of which, by the way, race is not one of these parameters. There are lots of things like, how many people do you know who have drug problems? Um, uh, the neighborhood that they live in, etc., etc. right? All things that are correlated with race, but race itself is not part of that. So this uses historical data based on those facts to assess uh, the probability of uh, a person being a risk for society. Now, this, is, uh, this has all kinds of ethical uh, uh, minefields, of course, because how can you use, first of all, how can you use uh, uh, parameters that a person has no influence over, like how many people they know with drug problems, right? Um, how can you use those to actually make a decision about whether he can go free or not? This is, uh, uh, this is a very strange uh, thing to do, but because it's based on historical data, it includes the, the bias of history. 
So everything, if you ever want to change, let's, let's say, a, a, a racist bias, and then you cannot use historical data to, 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 to base your future decisions on. If you look at this, uh, these risk scores, these are the risk scores between 1 and 10. Um, uh, 10 means a high risk uh, of, uh, of, uh, of committing another crime, and 1 means a very low risk. Uh, this is the average. This is the risk score for uh, for black defendants, and this is for white defendants. And you see that it's, it is uh, racist because it's based on historic facts, right? They're using real data for this. So um, uh, th there's a second ethical uh, pitfall in here, which uh, is that the algorithm that is used here is proprietary. It's owned by a private company that is unwilling to uh, reveal the details of the algorithm. And that means that the decision of whether or not people can get out of jail is based on, partly, on an algorithm where they had, nobody has any, no lawyers or anyone has any insight into how it works. So that's also, it's a strange situation. So ethical, and this is software, this is the only software. Ethical problems. I will hand them. Mike too. Mike. All right, so uh, you probably have read about this in the news. Uh, recently, there have been a number of fatalities uh, with autonomous vehicles. Uh, and I think this is, uh, Uber is probably the worst of the most well-advertised one recently. Uh, this is especially um, close to home in Pittsburgh as they do uh, testing uh, in our town. Um, so I was not very pleased to see uh, that this was indeed, you know, the worst case uh, actually happening. Um, yeah, so recently they, I, I guess in digging through all of it, uh, it's turning out to be a software bug, uh, which seems pretty awful uh, when it comes down to, you know, why this is happening. Um, this is probably the most extreme example that we're going to talk about today of a case where a um, software developer or a software architect could have potentially influenced the outcome. In this case, uh, the... Let's see here, I don't want to uh, diminish, you know, what's going on with this, but there's um, uh, a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, the general attitudes towards engineering principles, the kind of West Coast, you know, move fast and break things. All these ideas uh, uh, are being kind of tossed around uh, with Uber at the center of it. Uh, and then when you see something like this, uh, it's just not very cool, right? So uh, were the designers in this case uh, obligated to potentially prioritize other quality attributes higher uh, than, than the, what they, they were uh, prioritizing, right? Was time to market necessarily the right thing to be, to be looking into? I gotta, gotta say, this really pains me because they're testing in Pittsburgh and the SEI is right up the street. You know, uh, it would be great to see them partner and, and work on some of these problems. Um, all right, uh, who has a Facebook account? <laughs> yeah, your data, it's gone. Everybody else has it too. Right, so uh, Mark Zuckerberg in front of the, um, what is it, the House Committee or whatever uh, for the, um, I think this happened only a few weeks ago, uh, for the uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, effectively. Uh, with this, uh, so a number of, um, a number of years ago, uh, a university organization purchased uh, a block of data that was, I think, supposed to be anomalized in some way, but maybe wasn't. Uh, the data made its way into the hands of a private um, organization who was using it to uh, target um, specific individuals for advertising, uh, which, um, I don't know, was kind of questionable uh, in, in that regard as well. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go on that, but we'll just stop there. So, um, yeah, the 87 million users affected. Um, what obligations, I guess, were the software engineers who were collecting the data, who were doing, you know, writing the scripts to pull the data, who were handing it over? Um, should they have been asking questions about this, um, you know, uh, or was this just part of the job? Um, certainly up to a point, uh, you know, this is what they, what they do, right? Uh, that old saying about, well, I guess it's really a new saying because it hasn't been around for a while, but uh, when you don't get charged, uh, you're the product. Right? Um, so I guess the question that we should be asking ourselves about this example uh, is, you know, what obligation do we have as engineers and architects, again, for, for um, asking questions about these things or for challenging, uh, the, challenging the tasks that we're given? Uh, the Facebook case is, I think, particularly interesting because uh, there's a general mentality within the organization that what they're doing is really, really good and that only good things can happen. 
right, by kind of connecting everybody together and in, in, um, showing that, um, you know, we're all, we're all in this together, we're all in the world together, right? Uh, but unfortunately, there are, are bad actors out there. Um, so ignorance does not always um, excuse us, I guess, from that, uh, that regard. All right, uh, can, you, can you all think of uh, any other examples that might be kind of in that, uh, that realm of a uh, ethical question or an ethical problem, uh, either uh, from the news or perhaps from your own organizations or past, past organizations? How about not upgrading struts for 10 years? Say more. Yeah. Well, Equifax breach. Yep. Yeah, that the bug was known for many iterations, and they never patched it, and now we're all screwed for that reason. And uh, yeah, I patched mine afterwards. Yeah, and it, go, it gets even worse. Uh, the phishing sites that went up after that uh, for the when you were supposed to uh, sign up for the uh, the alerts. Uh, yeah, not cool. Letting your domain name expire. Yeah, all kinds of terrible things. Uh, what else? So, I mean, I'll jump on that, right? So, the OPM, the Office of Personnel Management for the, for the U.S. government, right, has a lot, of, a lot of names of a lot of people who work for the government, and uh, you'd think they'd take a little bit better care of that. And, uh, so, when they're hacked and millions and millions of names and all sorts of personal information is taken, it's, it's a little frustrating. Yeah, so... I'll, I'll yeah, this was the, the social security numbers, addresses for the past seven years. Uh, yep, exactly, yeah, relatives who, who you are. Uh, Elcho and I talked about this a little bit, whether or not a security breach or, or ignorance through security or, or mistakes in security would constitute an ethical, uh, ethical breach. Uh, I don't know if you wanna say anything more about that, Elcho? Yeah, we, we had another slide full of examples like that. But, but we felt, or at least I felt, that um, you know, um, uh, we wanted to focus on the, the situation where an architect actually has to make a decision rather, rather than just, you know, just be, do sloppy work. Because I think most of these security incidents are not the, uh, uh, the result of a, of a bad architectural decision, but of slop, sloppy work. But, uh, but uh, and, you know, I, I, I agree, it's, uh, there is an ethical aspect in it, and it's certainly closer to home than most of these examples. So the four examples that we showed you were uh, our typical, our extreme examples, and this is why they get into the news. And what we, what we would like to do to you is see if we can bring this closer to home. And this is why we, we will uh, have this exercise later on with you guys, where we have to discuss examples that actually are much more likely to cross your path um, uh, during uh, your everyday work. Oh, well, in response to your comment, uh I like to say that, you know, in civil engineering, um, a professional engineer has to sign off on all the uh, uh, plans and requirements. So as a security professional, you know, is there a professional engineering responsibility, you know, essentially to make sure that you do the work uh, instead of just passing it off? Because, you know, if the bridge fails, the civil engineer is on the hook. Yeah, please hold that thought, because later on, <laughs> Uh, we want to, uh, uh, to look at ways in which we can improve the situation. And, uh, and this might be, you know, going into the, that direction of uh, having an oath or uh, uh, other kind of uh, requirements for, for software architects might be one of the solutions that we, you would like to discuss. All right? Okay? So far for the examples. So, how do you decide what to do? It's not always easy. Um, so, to help us decide what to do, um, we have found some reasoning tools. And uh, this, that can be applied to ethics. They are not specifically ethical reasoning tools. But, uh, you know, we, we are used to using decision-making tools as architects, of course. But um, uh, these, these tools are a little bit, uh, let's say, more uh, uh, in, in the, the soft or the philosophical side. So the first ethics reasoning tool is called dialectic. Um, this is uh, from uh, classical Greece, I think, this, where this was originally invented. And uh, it is a way to, uh, uh, to, to treat uh, conflict or uh, to, to, you know, a trade, to make a trade-off between 
uh, what they call a thesis and an antithesis. So uh, there's a contradiction between two points of view, and um, uh, then uh, you have a dialogue, a discourse, and uh, this discourse uh, typically leads to what they call a synthesis, or synthesis, I don't know. And um, uh, now, of course, when this happens, the synthesis will, of course, be its own thesis, which uh, in turn can, you can then find an antithesis for. Uh, and again, you can have the dialogue and together come to a new synthesis. And this, this process can go on for a while, of course, until you have a better understanding of the, the world. Here's an example um, of finding the cheating software in, uh, in the product that you're working on. Uh, the thesis is I need to tell the world because this is bad for the world uh, if, we, uh, if this software is actually released. The antithesis is that, well, I'm most certainly going to be fired if I tell the world. And then, uh, you know, that's a contradiction. <coughs> One thing says that you have to do it and the other thing says that you don't have to do it uh, because it will have bad consequences. And then you can get to, uh, either internally or in, the, in, a, in a conversation with somebody else, you can get to this synthesis. Well, maybe if others have found the cheating software too, we may tell the world together, and then we have less personal uh, risk, right? So that's, that's one of the reasoning tools that you can use to, uh, uh, to deal with ethical uh, dilemmas. Second reasoning tool is called normative ethics. So once again, we are not experts in this. This is just stuff that we pull from popular books and Wikipedia, basically. Um, but it seems to make sense, so <laughs> we're presenting it here to you. So normative ethics is the study of ethical actions, and um, they are basically about, uh, you know, uh, the most ethical thing to do is the thing that maximizes the good for the world, right? And uh, of course, what is the good for the world? That is something that is disputed, right? And there are various schools of ethics that uh, have various ways of measuring, you know, what is, whatever is more ethical. And um, uh, so util utilitarianism is a, a school that actually uh, proposes that uh, the most ethical thing to do is the, the thing that causes the most happiness for the greatest number of people. Um, okay, so when does that model fail? Well, if most happiness for the greatest number of people means much, much, much less happiness for a small number of people, then obviously you're not doing the ethical thing. So that might be a, a model that fails in some situations. Um, then we have Mohist, that's uh, about order, wealth, and population being maximized, uh, which is kind of old-fashioned, I guess, because I, don't, I think we can no longer support the idea that it's better for the world if we have a higher population. Um, egoism is a very simple model, uh, and I think many of our economical models are based on egoism, which is that as long as everybody maximizes the good for their own selves, then probably we will get to a society where uh, the, 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 the amount of goodness is maximized for everyone. Um, and then we have situation ethics, which says that love has to be maximized. I'm, I will be curious uh, if any of you will actually use this measure uh, in architectural decision making, but uh, let's see how that turns out. Intellectualism, which is about, you know, the world is a better place if the amount of knowledge is maximized. Welfareism is about economic well-being, I guess. That is the school that uh, probably all of the governments in the world are currently sort of, uh, is it? No, not all. <laughs> and then we have preference utilitarianism, utilitarianism which is that, uh, uh, you know, every person may have their own preference as to which of these is better and that you actually have to look at your individual preference and uh, if everybody can maximize their individual preference, so one person is looking for love, Another is looking for money, another is looking for order, and uh, as, as long as you respect those preferences and maximize that, then you're on the right way. And um, then we have uh, the utilitarian trade-off, which is the third reasoning tool. Three is all we have. But, uh, and um, uh, this is about making a trade-off uh, between various you know, things that you would like to maximize. Um, so here is an example that I think, uh, thinking about this now, there's actually one more um, 
one more uh, one more ethic that maybe we forgot. Um, I'm forgetting the exact name of it, but uh, coming from uh, Kant, that basically there are some rules that are just sacred, and you can't violate those rules. Uh, so, for example, murder. It's never okay, right? Uh, whether you're trying to maximize for utilitarianism or not, right? I don't know what that set of rules is. I'm not going to tell you, but uh, the idea is that there are some things that should not be should not be crossed. Um, all right, let's run through a quick exercise and maybe try and apply uh, apply some of these ideas. Um, uh, specifically, maybe the utilitarian uh, trade-off here. So uh, this is a variant of the, tr the trolley problem, uh, getting back to the autonomous vehicles uh, example. Um, the first time I did this example, the audience practically cried, so I'm going to try not to do that, do that this time. But uh, let's pretend that we are software engineers developing a car, a self-driving car. Okay? Uh, we are going to be in the yellow... Uh, we have um, created a, um, the, car, the, the, the yellow car, right, is the one that we've developed. Uh, and there's, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say uh, uh, two people driving in that car right now. Uh, we're cruising on the highway, everything's going great when, uh, you know, we hit a bump and the pickup truck in front of us drops a giant uh, box, you know, it just flies out of the truck bed. I, I don't know why it did, but it, it did. Um, at this point, the vehicle cruising down the highway at like, I don't know, 60, 70 miles per hour uh, needs to make a choice based on the observations uh, coming in through its sensors. Uh, it could choose to run into the box, right? Uh, or perhaps uh, the engineers uh, could have selected to allow that to happen, right? Given the, the current parameters of the situation. Um, or perhaps uh, we could choose to swerve to one side or the other uh, based, on, uh, based on the situation here, right? Uh, to avoid the box, right? Uh, let's back it up real quick. So with each one of these situations, though, uh, it's kind of interesting, right? So uh, we've just put the, dri uh, the, the driver of the vehicle, the passengers in our car, the one that we sold to them, in danger, right, by uh, allowing them to smash into the object in front of them. Uh, likewise, uh, I don't know, we could do something like uh, calibrate the algorithm to favor, um, you know, the probability of, uh, probability of life preservation or something. So like, oh, big minivan. Uh, using our machine learning image recognition algorithms, we recognize that has a four or five, you know, four star safety rating. They'll probably survive. Let's crash into that instead, right? Maybe, uh, or maybe we could say, oh, you know what, minivan, it's probably got a family in it. Uh, let's just smash this motorcycle over here instead. There's no probability of, of uh, survival, but at most one person is gonna be harmed, right? Uh, what, would you, what would you do in this situation? Slow down, okay. So maybe attempt to slow down and then potentially still smash into the box, putting your passengers at risk. There is one issue with the slowdown scenario. Right, the world gets really complex, I guess, right? So there could be somebody rear-ending you. Okay, so why are we so close to the truck? That is an excellent question. So could there have been, uh, could there have been things that we could have done to further reduce risk of these situations from happening? Why would we be traveling at a speed which we could not uh, successfully uh, swerve from an obstacle, right? Why did we allow this situation to happen in the first place? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Gracefully, yeah, okay. Call Iron Man, get him in here. Well. Couldn't you just put some sweet hydraulics in the car and then pop a wheelie over the box? <laughs> I dig it, yeah. So looking for uh, relieving, relieving the constraints and potentially trading, uh, trading off some of our uh, business goals or something to improve the safety or, or increase costs potentially. Yeah, these are all excellent options. Uh, unfortunately, we don't always have the, the choice or the opportunity to kind of make those trade-offs. And I think the thing that, that uh, Elcho and I kind of worried about and got us started on this thread is... Um, Let's say that you're being given requirements that are kind of in isolation, which, by the way, with most of the examples we've seen so far, uh, the engineers doing the work didn't always have the whole picture. Um, you know, how, how are we supposed to make these decisions? And if something seems off or something seems like it could influence uh, a potential uh, ethical dilemma, what do we do about it? All right. Now, um, so, uh, we'll give, we're going to give you some hints as to how you can deal with the situations, but uh, as I said before, they are very, we feel that they are very incomplete and we need a, bit, a, a better toolkit for this. So, um, 
but the first, the first practice that uh, we have run into is uh, uh, by uh, Trina Falbe, who is a, a Danish uh, uh, woman who has wrote this book called White Hat UX. And it's actually about ethical user interaction design. Now, um, of course, I know we are architects, and uh, most of us probably not that interested in user interaction yet. I don't know. I was certainly triggered by yesterday's uh, talk about the uh, football, uh, football simulator. Anyway, um, uh, but uh, uh, she proposes uh, some tactics that you can do, and one of the things that she proposes is, um, is, uh, is trickle up. Um, so uh, that is even if you are not in charge because most of the ethical decisions of course get made by management they get made by the business stakeholders and we as technical staff are supposed to just execute their uh, their wishes or you know to, to create an architecture that, more, that best fulfills their requirements and of course this is where the conflicts come into being is where the requirements of your business stakeholders are in conflict with your ethical norms and uh, uh, she, she gives a number of examples. Uh, 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 one of them is uh, sensible defaults. Like as an architect, uh, we may not uh, be in charge of the decision whether or not we are going to build this particular piece of software. But uh, as we are building it anyway, we can be, uh, make decisions about what the default values of the various uh, uh, attributes are going to be. And uh, the example that she gives is, for example, uh, if you... Uh, register for some service and uh, there is a checkbox there that says that I would like to receive three emails every day offering me new stuff, then uh, that checkbox is, you know, it's probably the more ethical thing to, uh, by default, having that checkbox not checked, right? And this is the type of decisions that a, a designer or an architect actually can make, that you don't need to go to management to ask uh, uh, permission uh, for. And there, where you actually have to have the trade-off of, okay, so if we send them a lot of spam, then maybe we get more sales, or if we don't, then maybe we get, um, you know, we get perceived as a more responsible organization. And the second one is avoiding roach motels. I didn't know what a roach motel was, but apparently this is a kind of a trap for cockroaches that uh, is very uh, easy to get in for the cockroaches, but it's very hard for them to get out, right? And uh, there's... There's lots of uh, roach motels in our, in our software world. Uh, and the example that <laughs> she gives is, uh, who of you has ever tried to um, uh, delete their LinkedIn account? <laughs> <laughs> right? And she... <laughs> oh, actually, it's the Skype account. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, deleting the LinkedIn account was actually the subject of this morning session, so uh, my memory got a little bit jogged there. No, it's a Skype account. And she says, actually, it cannot be done. There is no way to using a computer uh, to, uh, and the internet to delete your, uh, your Skype account. Um, uh, you have to actually call up someone and, and manage to talk to a, an actual person because it cannot be done. And that's an example of a, of a roach motel. And there's many of these, like, uh, and this is how you end up being on, you know, 70 spam lists because it's very easy to get on. And so this is also the kind of uh, decisions, these design decisions, that uh, you may have influence or uh, as, as an architect. So that's trickle up. So I recently noticed uh, when you said Roach Motel that it's actually used as a new business model for capturing uh, uh, audience for startups. One is Fabletics, very easy to sign up, very hard to get off. So it's kind of becoming the business model for driving business. So are you saying that this is also no longer an architectural decision but it's a business decision? Okay. And Another one where you can see like the uh, Roach Motel being used actually as a, a business model, a Blue Apron, you can, uh, you have to go and uncheck scheduled deliveries. It's not the other way around. You're scheduled to get deliveries by default. You have to uh, do it. it. They only allow you to unschedule a month ahead. 
Yeah, I think this model was there already in the 70s. I remember my, my mother being a member of a book club that she tried to get out of. She got this book sent to her every month. <laughs> All right, but anyway, um, um, so trickle up means, you know, not, trick, not the, the, this decision is trickled down, but maybe there are decisions that are within your realm of influence and, or even realm of circle of control that you can uh, uh, make. Uh, this, the second practice is to watch out for edge cases because a lot of the unethical side effects, mostly unintended, of uh, the use of software, uh, especially now that software is becoming so ubiquitous and almost everything that you do you need software, is that um, the, uh, if you are not, let's say, part of the 95% for which everything goes smoothly, then uh, you may be in big, big trouble. And this, uh, I've seen some terrible examples of this in, uh, in, in a Dutch book that I read about this. Uh, by, uh, and the people who wrote this book were called the Kafka Brigade. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, I, and how, how, I don't know how it, uh, why we are getting more and more of these situations where it gets very, very hard for people who do not conform to a number of assumptions. Uh, that were made apparently when designing the software, uh, get, they're getting to more and more trouble that can, can go to extremes. Um, and maybe the, the, the popularity of the concept of the minimal viable pro product is actually a cause uh, of uh, this ignoring of edge cases. Um, if something is only true for 2% of the people, then maybe we don't need to worry about it yet. And then it, get, it never gets resolved, right? Um, uh, an example, um, I'll, I'll just continue. Um, this is uh, uh, an example of searching under the lamplight uh, uh, also, which is a joke uh, about uh, the police officer uh, doing, um, being on patrol, uh, on patrol at night and uh, seeing somebody um, uh, on their knees beneath a lamp post and asking what is happening. And he said, well, I lost my wallet. And then after 10 minutes of looking for it, the police officer asked, well, I can't find it. Where, where did you lose it? And he said, well, I lost it over there. And then the policeman says, well, why are we looking over here then? Well, because the light is so much better here, right? Searching under the lamp light. So um, uh, I guess it is part of the responsibility of the architect to look out for edge cases, not just for ethical reasons. I mean, we were doing that anyway already because we know that some of these edge cases actually break the architecture. And that if we are some designing something for 98% of the use cases, that it, it, it actually the, the whole system may lose all of its value uh, because, because it is not able to cope with this final 2%. And we still have to keep the old system uh, uh, you know, alive for years and years because we forgot to, to, uh, to uh, take care of this final 2%. two Anyway, so th those are the two uh, practices uh, that uh, we found to trickle up and, uh, and, and taking care of edge cases. Um, and so maybe these, these are of use to you when you discuss the scenarios that we're presenting to you. So let's go to these scenarios. Um, my, well, assistant, pass yeah, my assistant will pass out uh, one to each table. <laughs> Um, and I will, uh, I will shortly uh, introduce them to you. So, uh, well, divide yourselves in groups of four. That's, we were expecting less people to be here on the Thursday afternoon, so the, the, the groups are a little bit bigger, although they are a little bit uneven. So be, in the front here we have groups of three, and in the back you have groups of uh, seven. So maybe you can redistribute a little bit. Um, You can pick one of the five scenarios that I will introduce to you, and they are also uh, written down on the papers that uh, uh, you get there, and discuss the uh, ethical implications, maybe using the reasoning tools that we have been discussing, and try to find novel ways of responding to, to the situation. And uh, the five scenarios are difficult to appeal decisions, black box decision making, more business ex at the expense of privacy, discriminate by design and location guessing, and the reasoning tools I've <coughs> told you about. So here's the first scenario. You are the lead architect for a system that handles requests for disability benefits. Currently, 40% of decisions to deny a citizen such benefits is appealed, and only 10% of the appeals is successful. 
you are requested to design a change in the system that makes it less obvious to users how they can file an appeal after a negative decision, and that introduces an extra, apparently unnecessary verification step that is known to be error prone. A little bit Roach Motel like, right? But slightly different. You suspect that the department manager wants his, this change because of a target to lower the number of appeals from 40 to 30 percent. Okay? How do we deal with this? That's what well, that you can choose. Well, maybe you find the next one more interesting to discuss. And this is kind of related to the Compass algorithm. You are the lead architect for a system that helps rate resumes for job applications using a machine learning algorithm. Right? Especially uh, when you get in, uh, the economy is not so good, you, you can get a thousand applications for one uh, job and uh, it would be extremely nice if uh, some machine learning system would be there to throw away, you know, 990 out of those thousand applications. Although ethnical origin is not part of the data fed to the algorithm, you start noticing a bias for people with English sounding names. The bias may be caused by a similar bias in the historical training data, which was supplied by predominantly conservative firms. Your attempts to bring the bias to the attention of product management <laughs> have been met with evasive responses. What do you do? We have number three. More business at the expense of privacy, which is a little bit related to the example of Facebook, but maybe more closer to home. You are the lead architect of a set of, for a set of APIs of a social networking system at a startup that is quickly becoming successful. Product management asks you to design a change in an API that would give advertising partners a way to retrieve demographic data of all contacts of members that have agreed to the terms of use. Not the members themselves, but the contacts that they have in the system. Although strictly speaking legal, you strongly suspect that this is way more intrusive than the members intended. When bringing this to the attention of management, their response is that the change is required to sustain the growth of the business. All right. Now you see already you have brought it to the attention of management here. So you're one step ahead of the previous one. Scenario four, discrimination by design. Uh, you are the chief uh, architect for a book lending registration product used by libraries throughout the world. Your product manager asks you to design a new configuration parameter called modesty. If this parameter is set, the system will refuse loan of many categories of books if the member is female. Any attempts by female members to check out these categories of books are to be registered in the database. When asked, the product manager tells you that the company is opening up new strategic markets and that the survival of the company depends on the success in these new markets. Right? So the key aspect of this scenario is intercultural differences and the ethical implications of that if you are going international with your product. And then number five, location guessing. This is actually something that's, I don't remember which big successful company did this, but apparently this is going on right now. You are the chief architect of a free messaging app that makes money by running ads. The adver advertisements are more profitable if the targeting algorithm includes the user's location, but many users do not give your app permission to use the, their device's location data. Product management has recently asked you to see if you can deduce a user's rough location by looking at the geodata in photos taken by the users, because your app does have permission to open images in order to be able to attach them to messages. Tricky, huh? <laughs> okay, so um, let's see, what, what time do we have? How much time do we have left? 45 minutes. So uh, I would suggest take a half hour and then we have 15 minutes for uh, plenary feedback. Uh, with your tables, select one of the scenarios and uh, start discussing uh, the ethical implications and maybe things that you can do to deal with them. And um, if you are done with one, then by all means continue with the, with the next one, okay? Okay, everybody seems to have some, reached some kind of uh, conclusion, I don't know. So let's, uh, let's make an attempt to get uh, 
gather results here. Okay, um, so we have uh, about 20 minutes, so that's about three minutes per, per group. Um, I'm just going to pass the mic around and see um, uh, if, if you can sort of somehow summarize the most important aspects of your discussion in, uh, in three minutes, and Michael will try to keep up with you there. Um, yeah, I was the scribe here. Um, the first scenario we looked at was the scenario three, uh, which is the Cambridge, and Cambridge Analytica scenario. <laughs> Um, and we came down to some strategies to, to sort of deal with this situation uh, as an architect. Uh, the first thing we would want to try to do is to persuade management based on case law. Um, so we say, well, there was this other company that did something very similar and their executive ends up in jail. Um, another strategy is to try to provide alternative solutions like, well, uh, you want to grow business, but maybe we could grow business this way instead. Uh, the uh, third option is to remove ourselves from the situation, which is essentially quitting your job. <laughs> um, there is also the option to just live with it, suck it up, do as you're being told. May not be a good option, but it's an option. <laughs> um, and then the final option is to sort of uh, reach out externally, and there, there are sort of two alternative pathways there. And uh, the first one uh, is the less. Um, uh, course one is to go and, uh, for example, talk to a privacy watchdog or to escalate internally to sort of senior management, um, which would be the sort of more covered way to do this. And the other obvious way is to do some sort of whistleblowing activity, reach out to the media. Um, I, well, I, sort of in this order, uh, <laughs> I think. It, uh, as we were saying, it, it's the order that was kind of important because we'd like to do the first one, but might not be successful. Okay. Right. Plus, uh, plus the scenario three. Yeah, I think just Who's your scribe? <laughs> um, we thought that one of the most telling sentences there was the beyond the, the intent of the member. So we thought of a way that you could apply, you could do this thing if it's a requirement from higher up, but make it more explicit that the end user is opting in to this thing, or making them more aware of what the potential impact Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's go to this group. Who can I hand the mic to? Okay. <laughs> well played. So we did one, two, and three. Uh, so shall I? We didn't really scribe as much as uh, we should have done, actually. Um, so looking at scenario one, for example, the um, difficult to appeal uh, decision, we. There was lots of assumptions we made, and one thing we thought was quite interesting for discussion is: uh, Are we a public? Uh, are we a government organisation, or are we a private organisation working for the government? We actually had some interesting discussion as in does that make a difference? But we thought it does in terms of if you're working uh, for the government, you are you have a duty to the citizens and so forth, and so uh, there it would be a different, uh, perhaps, action that is needed in compared to a private company where you're, you have a fiduciary duty to the stakeholders to maximize profits. So that was one thing we threw up there, is, in, does it, is it a difference or not? That, that is an interesting one. Um, what else do we say? One thing that I said that kind of kept up with a lot of these scenarios, it's uh, the way I said it was, um, if you're a lawyer and you work for mobsters, you're probably gonna be defending people that have killed people. So a lot of these scenarios where it's like you work for a, for a social network that doesn't charge any money and sells the data, you're probably gonna be collecting a lot of data that maybe you shouldn't be. So a lot of these scenarios is like, well, are you comfortable with the business model, right? It, you know, so that came up repeatedly. 
We did, just finally, we did also um, have a couple of discussions across the scenarios around where do our boundaries lie as an architect, which I think is an interesting one, as in particularly now we have like operational. Like I almost thought earlier when we were discussing security, you could argue that's an ops concern, but I think it's an architecture concern as well. Um, so we were a bit unsure as a, as a team sometimes in where are our boundaries. Um, maybe our job contract does indicate that sometimes, but other times it doesn't. So uh, that's a challenge for us, I think, as well. One other thing we talked about is, as, as architects, I mean, one of our primary jobs is to communicate what the trade-offs are between our options, right? And so if we're, if we're being asked to do something like this, um, it's a protection for ourselves and it's an exposure to respond to the people who are asking us, our product owners or managers in this case, say, yes, this can be done. This is, you know, these are the, the consequences of doing this and, and just bring it all right out in the open. And I mean, if, the, if you're not comfortable with what the answer is at that point, then, I mean, the, the answer to all of these, the final answer to all of these is leave, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that solves the problem in every case, but it doesn't help you much. Right, right, yeah. Th thank you very much. So, two remarks from, uh, from, from my side. The, the first one is about, uh, I really like the, the um, uh, bringing, it, you know, bringing the trade-off to, to the attention. I mean, it's our duty, we are expected to give a trade-off, uh, trade-offs between architectural decisions based on criteria. And now, normally, we are asked to uh, to gather those criteria from the stakeholders that we identify in the project or for the product. But here, I guess there is a different stakeholder that you can add voluntarily, without uh, sort of uh, you know going outside of your own boundaries. Which and you you just add a criteria from by your own account, saying there is also ethical implications, and not not worrying about which stakeholders told you about it, but actually. This may be yourself. Um, I, I really like that idea of, uh, of volunteering an extra criteria in the trade-off there. The second thing is fiduciary duty. Um, uh, I've always wondered about this because I think this whole concept of fiduciary duty is in itself unethical. Uh, because it, it forces, it forces uh, employees of companies by law to go to the extent that the law allows to make profit, right? So it forces companies to find the boundaries of the law and, and get as closely as possible to, to, uh, to transgressing them, which is uh, you, you, it's very debatable in terms of you know, how good is this for society. Okay, thank you very much. No? Okay, we'll go to the next group. <laughs> I'd have no accent. Uh, so we were looking at scenario five. Right? <laughs> okay. I, I cannot make an accent up either. Um, so I guess first of all, it seemed like um, it was actually pretty clear that this is not what the user intended. Um, you know, they, because uh, they had, you know, in, in some cases, many users had said that they do not want us to, to collect any location data. Um, and so, for that fact, it seems unethical to be doing that through another route. And especially since it, it doesn't seem like uh, the app had, had mentioned that in the permissions of, of getting the, the images. So one, one way to remedy it uh, was an idea just actually maybe Disclosing that okay, you know, you don't want direct app, app date, direct location data. Um, we have this other way that's not so invasive because we don't know your exact location. But you know, now the fine print's getting very <laughs> detailed in the app permissions. Um, and so um, it was. It was that. And so in the end, this one ended up. We we, we, we looked at it from the dialectic perspective, and um, and it kind of actually followed the similar path to one of your examples previously, which was, um, you know, if you speak up, you know, you'll be either shunned by the management, you won't have career opportunities, you might be fired. Um, so a good solution seems to be if you can get other people on the team to um, convince them that this is unethical, maybe then you'll feel better about going to, going to management. 
Um, and then Sebastian had a really good devil's advocate approach, which was actually hard to argue against, which is if you take the, what is this, normative? If you say, what's the greatest good uh, for the greatest number of people? If you're showing, you know, the argument was if you're showing people ads that are relevant to them, maybe they're interesting, maybe they would show them interesting products. Um, is this better for more people? And it's actually, but I mean, I mean, it's actually not a bad argument in a way, <laughs> um, except. I can comment on that after reading this, the, the, this book. That is exactly the argument that most of, most of the Volkswagen employees had was that diesel, they firmly believed that diesel was better for the environment, and even if they had to cheat a little, in the end, it would help uh, the earth. <laughs> yeah. So, so, it, so, so it was an interesting... I said, I said, we said devil's advocate, so... Um, but so the interesting point that came out of that to me was that actually if you take these ethical tools a little too seriously or too technically, you can actually use them to come up with the answer you wanted in the first place. And so I think maybe you have to keep stepping back and say, okay, what, you know, what is our original premise here? What are we really trying to do? You know, simplifying the, the, the dilemma. Thank you very much. Actually, being a devil's advocate is a very good way of doing the dialectic, dialectic uh, method. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, we talked about the same scenario and had many of the same conversations, right? So, you know, we had, we had the same kind of ethical, well, you know, we're going to be serving them better ads, and maybe they want it. So we suggested, okay, don't assume they want it. Put that out there. I mean, if, if you really are, because we had a lot of really good conversations, right? It's like, well, you know, they let us, they gave us permission for the photos, so let's use it. Um, or, you know, uh, we're being asked to do this, so if it's unethical, it's not our problem, it's our boss's problem who made this choice, right? I mean, there were a lot of very interesting conversations, but at the end of the day, it was clear we can kind of convince ourselves of anything, but, so put that to the test, right? So if you really think it's going to be better for the user, present that to them. Say, look, we're not going to have your exact location. It'll be more generalized. It's going to give you better ads. It's going to give you stuff that you care about more, right? This is, this is going to make your user experience better. Is that all right? Just make it explicit. And, and that would be the conversation you would have to present when they ask Yeah. Like, propose, that they propose that we actually ask the user. not Because what we kind of assumed reading into this that, was that we were building off these kind of default OS level questions. Right. So it wasn't really, it's like, can we take advantage of this technology that your phone has, right? We haven't really explicitly asked the user, can we use your data in this way? So yes, that was our proposal. Okay, yeah, that was, uh, that was the initial conversation. It's actually this, uh, this question of, you know, is it a technology question or is it an ethical question? At least that's the way I frame it. Because simply asking, I think that asking, you know, has the user given us permission to use their GPS data is skirting the overarching uh, problem of have they given us permission to know their location, regardless of how we find it. And so, um, uh, so that was, I think, one of the, uh, you know, that was part of the initial discussion. And part of the other part was, okay, if we don't agree with the, uh, 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 conclusions of management, can we escalate it? Uh, I at least come from an organization where it is a part of the corporate culture that if we see something wrong, we speak up. Um, so what you said reminds me very much of this. It was a technical problem, an ethical problem, I don't understand why you said that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, personally I have this little concern about, you know, uh, an application going through my personal photos to find something. What else is it going to find in my photos? And so maybe the simpler technical solution is, okay, ask them for their GPS, you know, their location, but fuzz the data. And give them that option of, you know, you can, you can opt to fuzz the data so I, uh, the application doesn't know your precise location, but just your general location. We promise to do it right. Okay, thank you. Um, I think you were the last group. Which scenario did you do? Scenario four. 
So there's a few different things here. Um, if we quit, they're going to probably find somebody else, and we don't want to see this used in the incorrect way. So we're trying to come up with some solution, although we all wish we could quit. Um, there's clearly an ethical issue here, but it's also partially cultural. So we have to be careful that we don't apply Western ethics to when we want to expand to other markets. Um, so one of the things we want to start with is revisiting this with the management or the business case. Um, two really strong points would be, uh, one, uh, we're losing a huge market if we eliminate women being able to get what they want in almost every country. Um, and there's a, uh, the other one is we can't actually enforce this requirement. The requirement says if they select that they're female, but everyone on the internet lies and is always a male. So, you know, <laughs> how, you know how, how, how rational is this to even try to go out with? Um, but more importantly, maybe, there's a huge privacy or potential life-threatening issue here, which is one of the lines there that says, if any attempts by female members to check out these categories of books, um, they're to be registered in the database, which means we're actually showing it to them and saying, nope, and then exposing that to people. And for one, that would be horribly unethical in any culture, I think, for us as people, because you could do harm to somebody. But if anyone in other countries who didn't share these values saw that, we'd lose our current market as well. So that would be one of our big arguments to go back to them and say, we really should reconsider this. Um, however, if they really want to go forward with it, we have some options for them. Um, the most, I think, useful one would be, don't make this modesty a feature an administrator can just set. Um, make it locale based, potentially. So in certain countries, maybe they must enforce this by law or something similar to that. So code it that way. That takes the power out of some individual person and says, if you live in this area, we've built it to add this modesty feature that way. Um, so we can deliver it, but it's a little more controlled. And um, what determines which categories of books are modest or not should also be something not in the control of the person buying the software, but somehow some other taxonomy must be developed and used. And that's an architecture thing we could help build. Um, but I don't know how you agree on such a thing. But at least it won't be, okay, I don't, I don't like you know, Bradbury right now, so he's, I gotta have modesty to take him out, or uh, you know, Orwell or something, as opposed to Fifty Shades of Grey and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, mostly trade-offs for us, I think, and a lot of utilitarian, utilitarianism, but I'm not an expert on that either. Um, and hopefully they just don't build it, because that's awful. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, how much time do you have left? Uh, three minutes, two minutes. Uh, two minutes, okay. So final, final remarks? Um, I think maybe we should, uh, we should work this out and, and put it on some side or something. That would be nice that everybody can, can read it back. Um, um, I realized that I had a, a, a slide that's, uh, that I forgot to move, but that actually might be a nice uh, closing one. But this is what actually happened when engineers stumbled, the Volkswagen engineers stumbled upon the defeat device they uh, created a uh, very short PowerPoint presentation uh, to management that they had found this defeat device and, they, uh, and that what, what were the consequences. And uh, the reaction uh, of the manager was uh, to tell the engineers to destroy the presentation and to refine the software so that dyno mode, which was the other word for the acoustic uh, function, would not kick in except when it was needed to fool regulators. And the end effect was that the cars polluted more. So, um, uh, bringing it to the attention of management together with options of how to deal with it is, uh, I think it's a, it's a good idea, but it doesn't always work out in reality, uh, depending also a little bit, of course, on your company culture. I guess the conclusion, or as close as we get to it, is, uh, is in your, your answers here. And um, do you have any closing remarks? The idea of trade-offs, I think, is very interesting, and kind of bringing to bear the toolkits that we have as architects uh, is probably the best thing that we can do to work through these um, work through these questions. Uh, and just like everything in, in design, there's really not a right or wrong answer; just some answers that are better or worse. So, uh, really heady stuff to think about for your plane ride home. Okay. Well, maybe we can uh, propose to have a real expert on ethics uh, as a keynote speaker on next uh, next year's Saturn. Right? How would you like that? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. And <laughs>